All right, hello everyone, and welcome to this morning's last practice seminar of the semester. Um, today we have Liridona talking to us about her work on uh, the mobility ecosystem sprawl. Um, the agenda for the day is that this will be like an interactive presentation. So you can ask questions or use the raise hand feature or you post your question during the, uh, using the Q&A feature. And uh, it's better if you stick to using these two features instead of posting your questions in the chat. It's a little bit harder to um, find them. Um, and finally, what I would like to tell you is that uh, you can watch our upcoming seminars like to spur sign up on our website and you will also find our previous seminars there. And uh, yeah, just keep a lookout for it when we start updating for new seminars that will come up next semester. And uh, now, Liridona, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Bauna. Um, I don't know if we have our camera on or I'm uh, able to see any participant or anybody. <laughs> you will not see any participants, Liridona, but you can restart your own um, camera at this point. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this seminar. Uh, it's an early day and we are still struggling with Corona. So I'm really grateful that you were able to join and hear some of the research work that I've been doing in the past five years. Uh, I'm really looking forward to discuss with you um, a little bit of, oops, a little bit of my, um, doctoral research work, but also focusing a little bit more on the uh, recent study that I performed in Los Angeles. Uh, in the past five years, I've been quite interested in uh, trying to understand sustainable mobility and um, been working uh, with primarily understanding service development and design, and especially with a focus on uh, who is involved in participating in such processes and how different stakeholders are enabling or, or supporting the transition of the uh, transportation sector towards decarbonization. Uh, I have on, on intention put here an ecosystem sprawl. Uh, sprawl is a concept that is primarily used in, in, in architecture and urban design. Uh, where basically it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon which happens when cities start to grow unrestrictedly and without considering urban planning and without considering um, urban design uh, principles. So then you have these unrestricted developments. And I think the similar case is happening in the context of the uh, mobility sector. We are seeing a huge development of services. And uh, for this reason, there's been, uh, I think, a little bit of sprawl ongoing uh, around cities worldwide. Now, uh, just to give you a bit, bit of agenda for today, uh, I'll be talking mainly about four things. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we could, how I've been framing the mobility problem in the current, in the context of contemporary cities. Uh, my research has been done primarily in, in Sweden, but also I've been involved in, in Los Angeles and Sao Paulo and a number of European cities, uh, thanks to other researchers' work as well. And also we'll provide a little bit of agenda for what's happening in the current developments uh, that are being framed as solutions or as alternatives to the current system. And then we'll provide some of my empirical findings, uh, which I'm calling the real life laboratory of sustainability solutions uh, and, and this uh, presentation with some uh, patterns that I've been observing reoccurrent in the number of service cases that I've been uh, exploring, as well as present some of my most recent findings of a huge literature review that we have performed to understand the overall concept of um, access-based solutions, which I'm going to talk a little bit more here. Um, the mobility problem <laughs> basically uh, is a very complex problem. As you probably know, I'm not sure who is participating, what's the background, but uh, if we have any people from the public, so I would like to just go a little bit uh, deeper onto this, so we give a little bit of perspective. Um, in, in, in the sustainability paradigm, we are talking primarily about systems that are being embedded in current societies. 
And in these systems that we, we think are embedded, they are not primarily uh, systems that contain only technological artifacts. Uh, in the case of mobility sector, for example, today we have seen a, a, a huge development from the context of uh, artifacts like improving vehicles, improving fossil fuels and so on. But in, in this overall sustainability transitions framework, which is a concept where we look at how the society and uh, technologies are co-evolving together, we see a much more complex system than just improving vehicles, which has been the dominant paradigm of how we do, how do we transition to a more sustainable transport. Uh, vehicle improvements, of course, are necessary, but the, the overall system mobility, primarily here, uh, I have to say that I'll focus only on the pas passenger and, and road transport, since my research is not focused on other, other parts of the mobility system. I'm only looking at people's uh, ways of moving and uh, people's needs, basically. So in, this, in the, in the socio-technical system, then we have uh, a, a dominated transportation that is uh, predominantly uh, owned by the automotive uh, system that is car-centric and that uh, whose basically consequences have been developing for the last uh, hundred years. And in this, in, in this system, we have uh, not just the cars, but as I mentioned, there are regulations and policies, there is uh, maintenance and distribution networks like shops, dealers, there's the industry structure, basically the different industrial uh, partners working, and then we have the markets and uh, people's ways of, of, of behaving in the relation to mobility services and, and solutions. And then we have fuel infrastructures, and most importantly, and the one that the most difficult showing today to change, is the culture and the symbolic meaning that we have. Um, but seeing the, this automotive industry that is dominating the current passenger mobility tra transport is not only um, challenging for society and, 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 and the environment, but we also need to acknowledge that, of course, the developments in the automotive sector have been uh, having a considerable role in, in, in our economy. So when we want to change the system, then uh, we need to understand why we want to change, but also uh, how does it impact the rest of society, not just through the vehicles. So um, I am primarily interested in reducing car ownership and reducing uh, car dominance on the streets. Uh, that's the kind of problem I've been working on. Uh, why this is important is primarily because there are so many challenges faced by the uh, one, pa one car, one passenger driving mode uh, present in most of Western societies, but also in most of developing countries as well. Uh, these are probably what you see the most visible uh, problems or what I call visible costs to society in relation to having prioritized car centrism uh, as a predominant mobility mode and mobility alternative. But besides these, what is most interesting that, uh, of course, like cars take a lot of uh, road infrastructure, which is a lot of economic costs for cities and, 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 and countries. They take a huge amount of parking lots. Basically, only in US, there are more than 500 million parking lots. And if car ownership rates continue this way, uh, we would need at least two, uh, two Englands, basically two countries size of England to, to support uh, car mobility. Uh, and besides the obvious congestion, uh, cars also take a huge space, which could be used for other things such as housing and um, uh, urban planning for other purposes. Now, what I am more keen on trying to understand is the invisible costs of, of car-centric society. And the invisible cost we have revealed in the past 20 years, especially with more research in trying to understand automobility patterns and how the car has become such an embedded concept in society, uh, we see that there are quite many hidden costs, which also give us a hint that the transition or the efforts to make changes with new alternatives is not only related to the de like development of new technological solutions, because these solutions are directly competing or maybe not even competing, but in a way trying to substitute a more larger problem. And this is why um, I'm gonna share this because 
uh, you will see later with the studies how, how then the, the solutions are behaving in relation to this embedded system. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, thing that I've found is uh, quite interestingly the, the unequal access to, to mobility thanks to the car dominance. And this is something that I'm quite interested because as we are designing more, more new solutions, we are seeing that the participation of so social groups in accessing these services is becoming also a problem on its own. And if we are going to think more sustainable in, in relation to transportation sector, then this is an industry or a sector that really needs to think about uh, who is participating and who is being involved because we already are seeing patterns of unequal access over the new solutions as well. So um, these are a little bit, a few of the factors that uh, I could point out. There are way more that I'm discussing in my thesis uh, work uh, about the, the, the structural and more systemic um, factors that are hidden in, in different sectors, but there are primarily uh, infused or emerging from the car centric uh, paradigm. Now, um, Shoup, a famous researcher, primarily an urban planner, uh, did an, a, a huge study on, on the concept of automobility in housing and urban planning. And, and basically, uh, uh, he summarizes the fact that uh, the problem with the car centrism is not the fact that we, need, we don't need cars. Of course, vehicles as such are important devices for, for people's mobility. However, if we go with the idea that every human being uh, above uh, adult age that is able to have a driver's license and will access a car in the future, then we will not be able to sustain with this current pace of development. So the uses or at least the alternative ways of using vehicles will have to change. Uh, so therefore, for in my research, uh, I try to understand this, this, this phenomenon as, as a public design dilemma. Uh, meaning that um, the, the, the development of alternative solutions to mobility is not concerning only the private sector to bring more alternatives and develop technologies, but rather is, is a concern uh, for all the stakeholders, including public and citizens. Um, so here we are talking about a new way of developing um, society. And in this development, we must think about uh, how people are accessing the new services. So then I, I've posed some questions that I'm, um, I'm interested in that uh, if, the, if these mobility alternatives or if, if cars as one alternative, which is still gonna be present in our society, regardless of how we develop, uh, if they are so integral to the urban experience yet so destructive to the environment, but with so much potential for new uses, why they are being designed so rarely for their maximum potential or even minimum contribution to the urban experience. So then the question poses is that how do we decenter from this automobility centric society and primarily it's important to think then under what parameters we can assess that the new services or the new solutions proposed in the transportation sector uh, are contributing or leading to the emergence of better transportation. And as I mentioned, uh, can we start asking who is participating in the design of these systems? So then um, <clears throat> this is a little bit about the, the, the challenges that I, I've been pinpointing in my work. Uh, then I'm also interested to understand, okay, what future are we proposing? So. Uh, there are thousands of service models that I've mapped throughout the five years of research that I've done. There are also quite many services that have failed to embed in the urban politics or the what I'm calling in the urban space. And it's very interesting to ask why. Why is this uh, huge development pace yet with a huge failure rate as well? And uh, I've been trying to understand the, these, these, these little dynamics of these systems and how they are changing together uh, with a lot of factors. So just a little perspective that the, the idea of most uh, sustainability agendas worldwide is to 
basically decentivize or reduce the driving um, cars alone, at least reduce that challenge. And the solutions are either towards uh, increasing the mass transport uh, access or reducing mobility uh, on one hand. And within the spectrum, we see then an emergence of an amount of different solutions, which primarily are quite new, I would say, since the 2000s, uh, because the mobility industry is one of the least innovative uh, industries, I would say, in my opinion. And uh, it also, we, have, we are only now seeing an emergence of, of new alternatives. There are some interesting aspects that uh, I'm touching upon. Uh, one is that we are definitely moving, there is an industrial trend of moving from product, product oriented uh, development towards more service-based or access-based utility, where we are seeing uh, a tendency of, this, of the ecosystem to provide solutions that are basically increasing the resource effectiveness or how, how these resources are used and they are primarily shared among peers or they are accessed through uh, um, new technologies that support uh, a shared access among different peer communities. But there's also a tendency of huge integration uh, of, the, of, the, of the platforms and, and solutions thanks to the emergence of, of GP, GPS, uh, tracking sensor, sensor technology, connected uh, products and services, as well as um, information communication technologies. The other trend is that we are seeing a, a, a huge shift from the idea of owning goods, uh, products, including vehicles uh, such as cars, and also um, towards more access-based um, solutions where people just access uh, uh, services instead of owning their own private cars. But also we see a tendency to move from the physical towards the digital um, space where more and more solutions can be more effectively used. I mean, uh, instead of having 20 cars being used by one individual in a housing condominium, we can actually have two cars being used by 20 people instead. So this is the um, uh, changes that have been experienced throughout the system. Uh, also, we see a very interesting tendency uh, to have a, a more um, a more democratic and participatory uh, design of services where uh, on one hand, uh, this is not necessarily just because developers are interested to, to talk to their users, but primarily because these concepts are demanding a more involved citizen or, or user or customer in the process. Uh, primarily because for them to, to be actually used, they need the, the, the users and since we are talking about utility based instead of ownership now there is more and more interest for the developers to really involve people in their in their services because that's how their services are dependent we no longer are paying for owned product where the developers no longer take responsibility of what happened to a product but rather we're talking about usage of that product meaning that this is a more dynamic and constantly active relationship between the developers and users. Now, this is uh, why I say this is important as, as I will show you in some of the results that um, usually most of the services are, are failing because they've also failed to engage uh, in, in the concept of services. Uh, most people who are, or most organizations who are transitioning towards these alternatives they have a challenge understanding the nature of services itself because primarily they have been mainly um, uh, developers or, 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 or product manufacturers and now suddenly they want to provide services so there's a barrier there. Uh, however, it's very important also to question that these services, these designs uh, are going to be placed in, in a social context. And when solutions are placed in a social context, definitely their usage rate changes and the, the way they are perceived by society changes. So in research, we are also very interested in how these new developments of services uh, reach out to users and what kind of social practices or social behavior they stimulate uh, with these changes. Uh, what what this has implications for society and how society will then behave as we move towards a total 
or, or maybe uh, predominantly service-based uh, mobility solutions that are privately uh, offered. The other um, aspect that we need to think about is that mobility services or, or solutions towards uh, sustainable mobility have been predominantly service oriented. Now, there is a challenge with understanding services in other sectors and mobility, because there is the challenge of mobility is happening in the public realm. Primarily it happens on cities. So when you suddenly start to provide services that are part of this public space or these cities where already this space is heavily contested and conflicted with multiple stakeholders, then we, we see also a different behavior of these alternatives. So therefore we cannot really compare with other industrial sectors like for example, accommodation or, um, or other, other sectors of the economy where you have a private space that is being turned into a service or so on. In the mobility context, there is a big challenges for operators or the providers of these solutions to figure out how they become part of the city. And this shows to be quite a big challenge. Uh, the last part that I am interested to discuss and bring forward since it will be important for the research results that I'm gonna share is that most of the industrial sector has been primarily focused on developing services in the context of making them better utilized and making them more improved either through vehicle alternatives such as electric vehicles or uh, fuel uh, alternatives or um, service models that are slightly different from one another or that they are um, providing newer technologies. Now, according to most research, um, this is only part of the problem part of solving the problem. Because if we are interested in reaching a full decarbonization agenda, which is basically reducing emissions to the level where is different for different uh, countries, like in Sweden, we have different agendas for 2030, 2050, 2060, and 100. And in, if we are going to go there, then we really need to start thinking beyond the, the, the technological solutions because technological solutions are already insufficient and primarily, as I mentioned before, they are competing with what we call existing regimes or existing systems that simply don't want to leave <laughs> this society or that they will continue to stay but maybe be adjusted and, and, and change in a different way. So systemic changes is what uh, is something that I've been looking around that when, when we design a service, when we design a solution, we can no longer just think about uh, the solution itself, but we must think about quite many parameters that shape this system and how this solutions will perform uh, in society. Now, to transition to work from, from this idea of automobility norm, because automobility is primarily a cultural uh, embedded uh, phenomena. Uh, some scholars call it a Frankenstein uh, monster because uh, it has a lot of challenges within it. Uh, we also need to think how alternative systems are also providing societal functions basically, because if we are only going to focus on, on alternatives so that we mitigate emissions and we do not provide good functions for societal, uh, for society to conduct their everyday life, meaning if we don't create support systems for people to do their mobility, then we are, we are also going to fail in a much more stronger rate, primarily because people today are much more cautious about the technologies that they consume. So people demand much more uh, from technology and solutions and demand much more from the designs that they are willing to use. So let's see what, uh, what is it that I've found in the last five years of my work. Uh, I have primarily done research in the field and really working with different concepts of mobility and quite interested in, in, in trying to understand the, the, the um, user challenges. Um, and so we have, um, we have been quite interested in, in understanding how services are behaving in the context of humans' everyday life. I'll show you a, a little bit of uh, two of my research projects. Uh, but before, just to give you a brief, uh, services work in this um, function. 
Primarily, we have an operator that connects some devices. These can be any kind of hardware devices with an interface that is primarily supported by uh, a software that is uh, usually equipped with um, GPS tracker sensors and application and uh, that is launched to the end user. But in this platforms, you also have multiple other users that are being connected. And these systems are directly uh, functional because of data streams. And although these are quite some challenges today facing the mobility sector, data privacy rights and data is being sold to third parties and management of data is quite a challenge. This is not something that I've touched on my work, so I'll leave it for um, other scholars. Uh, so these are some of the research cases I've been working on. Uh, so I've tried to understand services from a number of concepts. Uh, and I have primarily looked at small electric vehicle sharing services, which is a solution that uh, provides, um, provides citizens with mobility through quite radical vehicle devices that are small, uh, lightweight, and also completely battery powered. Uh, another case that I've looked at is uh, the electric scooter sharing services. Um, and then a third one is that I've looked at car sharing services, uh, different platforms, uh, ride hailing services and delivery services. But today I'm only gonna talk about the first two because uh, of, of the time, So, but I will share the common learning from all cases. Um, and more of this you, you can see in my thesis that I'm gonna defend um, soon in September. Um, the first case is that we have done a, an experiment study where we, where we took basically um, 10 small electric vehicles and deployed them in two large workplaces in Sweden. Uh, and we designed a, a very radical multi-user service model where people, where we could basically increase maximum utility function of the vehicles so that vehicles would be used all day, but by a huge number of, of users. And also they would be fully utilized throughout the week with the different concepts of different users. And in this project, we had um, more than 500 test users and uh, around 157 users that were involved considerably over a period of two years in the, in the organizations that we deployed and where we looked at the primarily how these services are posing challenges for the system changes. Some of the results that we have seen is that um, there are really logistical challenges with implementing services in the context of everyday life for people. Not because people are not interested in transitioning from their car, private car ownership towards more service-based um, mobility, but because there are um, in interlinked systemic parts of the system that make these solutions look fragmented or dysfunctional when they are applied in, in in every day. Here we talk about, uh, for example, the, the, um, the, the way booking systems are designed, the way how other, other users are become, becoming entangled in the system, uh, the, way, the way you place uh, the location of the vehicles, their availability and accessibility, and how the battery is functioning, and especially the, the infrastructure designation, uh, among others that are all need to be thought strategically for these services to, um, to perform better. Uh, the other is that there are also emergent use challenges that how people or users in this context perceive these um, alternatives. And usually these systems um, create um, a different perception of time and efforts for the people using them and that people perceive them primarily as as uh, rigid uh, yet not so flexible uh, primarily because they are shared with other peers then they create a sense of responsibility and uh, peer dependency that uh, in a way seems to or at least appears in people's everyday life to have some uh, negative effect because people already seem to have uh, busy lives and they do not really want to uh, have too much effort to plan their mobility as well. Most of the time with a car ownership, people do not need to plan their time. They can have the car whenever they need it. They can have the access to it whenever they need it. And usually it's in within the vicinity of their own walking proximity. So 
when these solutions become part of the system and they do not resemble the car, then people start to compare it with the cars and they want the same freedom and flexibility of the car. And this has been one of the largest barriers also found in other studies, not just in this experiment. However, what we see very interesting is that uh, most of the mobility services tend to target the, a certain type of user group. And in this project, we try to understand variety of user or social groups so that we can understand in what kind of context do these services work really. And certainly we have found many interesting aspects in this regard because uh, services cannot be targeted to a, a standard type of user model that we have seen in the industry, which is primarily educated younger people with a higher income. Uh, but we need to start thinking about how we instead design these services more strategically so that they can fit with different social um, demographics, socioeconomic groups, as well as uh, social preferences, basically. And today we already see a majority, and, and this is very interesting, I, I cannot believe that pro most of industrial services uh, deployed worldwide tend to compete with the same target user group. And this is something that I think contributes to the why we see a large failure rate, because we have an oversupply in, for some social groups, and then we have a complete underserving for um, another or majority of societal groups. This has to do, of course, with the, with the economics, with the, with the business models, with the lack of understanding really social preferences of, in terms of services, and also because these services are relatively new, so we still have more, more work to, to do. Now, what we also saw is that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a huge relevance of the non-user groups. And this is predominantly avoided in most of design and development of services. Uh, and this is something that I, I, I am trying to raise and understand better because only now I've seen the, the relationship between failure rate of services and the relevance of non-user groups or not taking these use, the, the, the people who do not use these services into account for trying to understand how these services can grow their, their, their market um, uh, availability. Uh, the other aspect is that people uh, have shown a tendency to change, as I mentioned, uh, but this really depend, is dependent on how these services are supporting uh, people's behavior change. And most of the scholar work tries to blame uh, that society is, is, is heavily embedded in cultural norms. Of course, that is true. There is a, a tendency that people will stick to their car owns ownership because they lack information or knowledge about these services. But in my case, we have seen a huge interest for people to really uh, want to change from their unsustainable mobility practices towards becoming more uh, understanding and connected to the, what's happening in the industrial or technological developments. And this is, I think, somehow neglected uh, by many stakeholders when considering uh, services. Uh, and that also has to do with the um, idea of how these services then uh, grow or tend to stagnate. Um, another challenge, or not challenge, but I would think another aspect that is quite interesting for mobility services and, and that on which these services are dependent on, as I mentioned before, is the space. Uh, we have seen from this experiment quite clearly that um, this, the service design, no matter how good vehicles you have, no matter how good service you design, it is not always the fault of the operators but it's primarily because our societal systems or these, these services operate in an urban space that is predominantly designed with system rules that apply to only one type of, of uh, modality or one mode of transportation. And when you have the introduction of new services that contain different vehicles, different system uses, you are met then with a lot of challenges in relation to how the parking norms are functioning, how the streets are being designed, what is the supporting infrastructures, um, and how these uh, are working also in regulatory terms. 
And because there is a, a complete stagnation, I would say, from the regulatory parts in supporting uh, these mobility services, uh, there's been also um, a challenge because there's a predominantly economic drive of these services. So then there is a tendency for using cities and public spaces for uh, private benefits. So there's been a challenge. But however, what is also another uh, aspect is that in the space of the city, there is a lot of stakeholders, as I mentioned, and therefore many interests and goals of various stakeholders are not always aligned are not always convergent and they are often met with uh, certain traditions and ways of working, which then is negatively affecting the overall system transition. I'm not saying about individual service providers trying to really provide their services in the city. It's more like when multiple services are interacting with one another, then we, we see system uh, effects. And in this regard, we have seen a lot of conflicts, even among the new services competing for the same space, competing for the same users, for the same uh, uh, place in the city strategic locations. Uh, now, this, the, this, the final um, case that I wanna um, talk about is the... Um, uh, <clears throat> oh, okay, I think that we have some questions maybe before I go on to the final part. Uh, any questions from the audience? No questions waiting at the moment. All right. Maybe uh, it's maybe we we can take it in the end, or should I take another one later? <clears throat> Uh, no, I think it's fine. Remember, um, everyone in the audience, that you can uh, raise your hand or ask a question in the Q and A uh, section at any time. Um, if yeah. You have a little time to answer. Exactly. If there is something unclear, please stop me. Uh, of course, I'm 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 happy to discuss more. I've tried to condense a lot of work into small sections, but of course, I'm happy to clarify if there is something unclear. Um, so the second case I've looked at is the, the electric scooter services. And this I've primarily looked at in the, in the city of Los Angeles in California. Uh, primarily I chose to go there because uh, the first experiment I did was in the context of an experiment. So it was isolated and people really were aware that this is a solution that is being experimented. And I really wanted to know in the real life context how these services are operating. And uh, since we have seen a huge emergence of, of new mobility services, and probably you're all aware about the, 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 the large uh, appearance of the electric scooters in majority of the cities worldwide, then it became very interesting for me to understand these electric scooters, not because I'm interested in the devices themselves, but I'm really interested in the, in the usage rates and, and the users and how these designs show some certain consequences for the future of, of sustainable transport. Um, one might think that the difference between a vehicle such as a car sharing service, for example, which is using primarily vehicles of larger weight and size can be very different from the uh, mobility services offered by electric scooters. Uh, yes, that's true. However, what we see in behavior is almost similar patterns. And this is what I want to discuss at the end of this presentation, how these, all these services have a lot of things in common. And they all, all, almost are mimicking one another, which is such a strange phenomenon that I've started to observe in, in the industry. It feels like there is one person or one organization is creating a service and then there is just a huge spillover effect with orga other organizations just mimicking the service, mimicking the business model, and just basically starting to compete heavily with one another to the point where they create more harm than actual support or, or further develop their services. So this is quite interesting uh, to go into in depth and look at the industry from a number of services instead of looking at only one type of service, uh, because this is how we can derive patterns and then see how this is actually going forward. So um, it, with the electric scooter case, I wanted to expand it much broader uh, and try to understand what really happened from the emergence. As you might have seen, there's been a huge conflicts in the cities about the electric scooters. 
Uh, and the way electric scooters have been introduced and the services have been advertised and the way the public has reacted to it and social groups and stakeholders has been quite a challenge. It's still an ongoing challenge. The regulation in cities is not yet fully determined. So there is a quite interest to understand, okay, what, what this service is meaning for society and what this service is, is it here to stay? Is it here to go? These are the, uh, I would say more shallow questions that are being asked. I do not believe that these services are here to, to last for a bit of time. They are just gonna keep adding more. And that is uh, another layer that is quite interesting to go deeper because more and more newcomers are, there's more and more space for mobility, for new mobility services. And this is only the tip of the iceberg of uh, radical devices that we have seen their development in the last five years. Um, four years ago, I was in a conference in for Light Electric Vehicle Summit, and it was mind blowing to see how many amazing devices can be supporting mobility of cities uh, in the cities, especially for short term commutes in the future. And are cities prepared for these? Uh, I do not think so. Uh, not even they are not prepared, they cannot even foresee any of this disruption coming. And this is mind blowing to, to know that we have been working in sustainability agendas for more than 20 years and yet you take any political uh, document and you analyze it and you see conflicts all over the place on how this mobility transition should look like. And then that leaves us wondering, okay, what is the really the, the scholarly effect on, on this policy making? Because we keep seeing more and more introduction of services yet less and less um, support by the city states. At the same time, it's not really only to blame the, the, the policy because we also see an aggressive expansion plan of the private sector to dominate the public uh, space. And this will have to be balanced between some sort of new collaborations instead of competitions and instead of industrial industries co collaborating, we need to have a cross industrial cross stakeholder uh, approach to the sector. Now, just briefly, uh, before I divert into saying more things. Uh, it was it has been clear to me that the the most mobility services follow a similar pattern to the e scooters, but in the e scooters we could see that. Of course, it's a learning curve uh, of other previous failed solutions such as stationary bikes. So just to give you a bit of context, e-scooter services are primarily have been having a huge boom because of the flexibility provided to the user. But what I've seen from these results of the study is that this flexibility is primarily the problem also why they've had a lot of conflict in the city. Because in one way, we want to provide huge flexibility to the users, which are today very demanding. And on the other hand, we see a, a huge disparity uh, between uh, ability to cope and manage these services. So previous learnings gave a rise, uh, meaning that a lot of stationary based systems where basically you have like docks where, where cycles, bikes and other modes of mobility are stationed in a place and you have to drop and pick them in the same location. The, the e-scooter services are more interesting because you, you basically can drop them and park them anywhere. The other was the GPS, GPS accuracy and sensor technology improvements are, have been considerably giving rise to these services and also managing their, their, their evolution because if it wasn't for these, these services would not be able to operate simply as that. Uh, and then uh, also there's been a considerable large investment funds in the mobility sector from venture capital to, uh, to diversify services and also primarily because Uber as the largest mobility operator on earth started to have a huge debate. So many, many people from the Uber, in, uh, Uber part of the world uh, started to shift to other entrepreneurial activities. So I could clearly see that the majority of electric scooter operators are coming from people who have previously worked in, in the Uber um, company. So uh, what we could have seen in the growth rate of these services is that quite interesting results actually, um, primarily has been very low entry barrier to the market, no regulation, easy to step on a vehicle, uh, just 
book and go. And where else more this could work than in Santa Monica, where these services were launched, where is a huge touristic rate in this beach area of Los Angeles. And of course, that gave a visibility effect of these services to the point where they quickly uh, were taken up by the media, uh, primarily because of the pricing business model, uh, pricing model that is like the pay per minute, which apparently appeared to the user groups as a very affordable service uh, and very easy to use. Uh, the other aspect that uh, I found was that um, decentralized operations. There is a huge tendency by all mobility operators to externalize their operations so that they can reduce the costs and basically reduce the responsibility of managing these infrastructures. Uh, these are primarily uh, externalized to third party labor uh, and other uh, management as you have seen probably when, when the scooters, I'm talking when the scooters were launched because we have to differentiate that it's been two years these scooters have been operating, there's been considerable development because of the state regulations as well, but uh, the business model has been also changing a lot. Uh, and I have only studied the part when they started to emerge to the last year, so I only have data for that period which I will cover. Uh, there's been considerable changes continuously in the, especially last year. Um, the other part is that we have seen a tendency for aggressive expansion plan, meaning that what happened? Most operators start to introduce a huge fleet because they know there's no regulation at the moment. So they, re they increase the fleet number because that creates a visibility effect. And in this visibility effect, then they create a network peer effect, meaning that people see them more and then they, they start to talk about these services. And when they start to talk about these services, there's also a peer tendency to pressure each other to start using both for attractiveness, but also for fun. And then this is how the overall system grew. The other part is also that these, these services have been launched primarily very strategically. They are not being launched just anywhere. They have been specifically focused on densely populated cities, yet without specific regulations for these type of services. And uh, this has allowed uh, also an additional visibility to these services. The other aspect is that from the beginning, you could see the language or the way the businesses communicated was that they're gonna solve the problem of, of mobility transport, last mile transport. They are a sustainable solution. They are a better alternative to the car. So all these narrative really helped to attract the initial user base. Uh, however, there's been, as I mentioned, a lot of conflicts with the electric scooters uh, and these I've been interested to know why. Uh, and it uh, seems that um, these services basically had no regulations from the beginning, and the only regulations that were applied to them were blending machines on, on streets. On one way for the private operators, this allowed them to deploy quick and fast so that they create a user base and then can convince the cities that, hey, this is working for us. Uh, but however, um, from most of when I looked at the overall development from 2017 to 2019, you could clearly see the evolution of cities interfering more and more with these services because of the larger problems that they have started to create. And um, however, we also I, I was also able to see that from the beginning, there was really no clear of no clear directives whatsoever by all the local governments that I looked at into their documents. They had no clear directions on what to really do with these. Yet, in the sustainability agendas of Los Angeles, for example, you clearly see that micro mobility services are the number one, like they are being supported and they are being awaited for the future. So, on one hand, you have these state politicians that want to meet their own agendas where by supporting these services on one hand you have the problems of citizens complaining for these services which then uh, push these services to a in the middle argument between the state and the residents. Now it's very important here to note is that the tendency for most services has been to focus on their users. And of course these services have a huge user base of primarily one type, one trip, uh, uh, type of usage. And then most of these services have used this database of users to comply with, this, with the authorities and launch their fleets in other states. However, what we see is that the source of conflict has not been the users, has been primarily other stakeholders in the ecosystem that have created the challenge 
for the cities because these these companies absolutely do not consider uh, other stakeholders in the street. They only care about their user base, providing great service to their users, but then the outside effect, complete negligence and no consideration. Of course, now lately with the more enforcement of law, we have seen a more compliance. Now, this picture, for example, shows one morning supply that I was able to map uh, in Santa Monica region of Los Angeles, which is the Bay Area of the city, where most of the operators started competing. And here you can see a picture of at least seven operators competing. This, there's a tendency of an oversupply of these services in the same area, as I mentioned. And this started to create what, what the, the, the overall um, problem with these services, because you not only had oversupply and low usage rate in the beginning, but you also had a large clutter in the cities. And this started to block the sidewalk, block the entrances of building, block the restaurants for the owners. So these people started to complain to the, to the uh, areas. Uh, and what happened is that the early groups that started to talk about these services were the elderly walking with crutches who started to perceive a problem with their safety. And the others were the restaurant owners and the people who were living in, like in the residential areas where they were being completely just left out by the primarily the young user base of the scooter because these were the first number of people uh, attracted by these. So meanwhile, the user group was growing, meaning younger people coming to the user of these services. There was another uh, other social group starting to complain heavily to the local uh, governments to do something about them. So these disagreements between all these stakeholder groups really provided great mobilization for the popularity of e-scooters. And in a way, I doubt that the companies opposed this because this gave a huge media coverage without them needing to do advertisement. So these disagreements kept popping up in the media. And then this is how also more and more people got to hear about that. And then what you could see is that within the first four months of operation, you already had six operators in Los Angeles with more than 3,000 uh, fleets, like 3,000 devices per fleet. So <clears throat> these challenges started to become more apparent when you had more and more introduction of these services and less and less regulations happening because of course regulations do not follow straightforward these services. Now we should not be so judgmental to the services because these services do have a promising um, uh, solution for the short term mobility which really is one of the problematics why most people use cars like the perception of five kilometers drive that most people tend to be lazy and try to uh, use, I mean, not always lazy, but most people perceive the need to use a car and this need is primarily in this vicinity of the kilometers. And these uh, oppositions then started to create not the narrative that, hey, services, um, services are a problem, uh, but rather, hey, these services are a better solution to the car. Now, I'll move faster to this because I see that the time is running uh, and I have much more to show. But what is a consistent pattern among the services is the same that I found in my other experiments is the operational challenges of managing these services. Now, most of the research has been so focused to try to understand how people are behaving, how people are using them, why they are not using them and so on and so forth. Very few research has been focused on the challenges of the operators to truly provide a good service in the cities. And this has shown a considerable inertia than why these services are failing, because there is really um, a, a lack of a collaboration between public um, and street and infrastructure managers and these services to negotiate considerable changes that could be supporting both better management, better usage rate, better uh, uh, spread and coverage of these services. So I saw that the streets, the, the, the infrastructure, the regulations and rules have been also dominant problem here in the e-scooter case as well as in my other case with the light electric vehicles. Uh, challenges are also not just operational, they are also uh, problematic for the usage and the labor. 
Uh, as I said, there is an economic drive here that has a tendency to cut the cost and while giving transfer of responsibility and accountability to the state, to the users, to the labor force that initially was completely externalized. Basically, the, 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 the scooter companies only provided the scooter as a service. The rest was taken care of by these employees who were just picking up and arranging them and charging them and dropping them out. And this seemed to be a huge laborious pro, uh, process, uh, as I've shown with the interviews I've done with a number of stakeholders in this in this area. Um, what hey, are so, sorry, yeah. sorry, Lady Donna, can I can I jump in quickly? Yeah. Um, so we have uh, we have a question. Um, okay. So I can I can read it out if you'd like. Um, the in the scooter revolution, I see a lot of parallels with the dockless bikes uh, revolution that started in China in 2016 with Otho and Mobike. Mm -hmm. That revolution led to great new services for citizens, but growing concerns regarding the sustainability of the business model. The question is, do you think the scooter industry will avoid the mistakes made by Mobike or Otho, or do you think that the competition will lead them to make the same mistakes once again? <laughs> Yeah, um, so I do not think that uh, we are not going to see the same pattern with dockless. Uh, however, what the in what the scooter industry has been um, doing better than the dockless is that they have been starting to create partnerships with the local governments and convince them over their agendas. And really, I see a lot of greenwashing by these businesses because uh, these businesses have been able to survive primarily because of large investment funding coming towards them to the point where they can expand that to a maximum. At the same time, the waste rate of these products and thrown, because I've even looked at the third market uh, or the secondhand market, which was fascinating in Los Angeles to see how many small electric scooters were being completely hacked and removed from the fleet without any challenge by the operators because they simply did not care. The speed of the development was so fast that these operators could not care less. And this cannot be done without having enough money, I would say. Because I can't remember what our discussions, what we said. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, um, now we're um, now we're approaching the end of the allocated time that we have. So um, I would say to those that can't stay past nine thirty, if you if you'd like to ask um, a question a question now, please do so in the Q and A or uh, raise your hand feature. Um, otherwise, we can continue um, for a little bit longer, um, and uh, we can share the um, little Donna's email address if anybody has questions to send in afterwards. Yeah, I only have two more slides, I think. Ah, okay, great. So if we um, if we carry on now, um, and um, feel free to raise your hand as usual. Yeah, thank you. And uh, sorry that, yeah, it's 9.30, I'll not I'll take long, but just to give you a summary of this all work. So what, what I've been able to notice then is that um, I'm, I'm trying to understand that what, which type of development is leading to what type next, because as I said, I think we will have more and more introduction of new devices. And honestly, I think we will move away from the car centric society by introducing smaller, lighter electric vehicles. And there is no escape to that. And I have already seen automotive industry starting to prepare for this. And, uh, but the challenge is real in terms of uh, implementation barriers that these services face both in terms of operational costs and also uh, to themselves as a business, but also operational costs introduced to uh, cities management and utilities. Now, if we compare with the car industry, of course, the, the, the effects is minuscule. I do not agree with researchers trying to attack scooters as, oh, they're not environmental and so on and so forth. Yes, clearly, but the car industry effect compared to the electric scooter effect cannot even be compared. So the, if we are able to diversify transportation sectors, so at least a percentage of trips done by the car can be done by e-scooters, even if e-scooter lifespan has been allegedly seen as very short. Of course, in the beginning, it was less than 10 days, the, the, the first generation. But it's incredible how much the industry has responded in terms of technical development. Like we have seen at least six generations of new scooters coming out. 
and we have seen a huge improvement of operational side by the by the companies what we are still lacking is city support and city support has been primarily trying to create caps and quotas and and limit speed and limit a lot of things but they are not looking at the adequate problem that simply as designing or or or, or marking street lines for e scooters could be a solution to the problem now the biggest challenge that what I found is that why I mentioned in the title the, the their place in the urban space is that the majority of conflicts for all these services are seem to appear the same. They do not have a space in the city. Simple as that. The the roads are designed for the cars. The street lanes uh, are designed for walking. Uh, the bike lanes are primarily designated for bikes in a speed lower than thirty, where the scooters do not really fit because of technological differences simple as that we will need to create shrink in the streets for the cars and create more space for these devices if we are going to support uh, the transition otherwise there will be continuous challenges among the stakeholders and here i see then the stagnation which is only harming uh, uh, the development and instead of really supporting it now, what in this picture I've tried to bring together to see what were the effects, like basically, if we look at it in a nutshell, it took us 100 years to really start with car sharing, like diversify transportation sector a little bit in terms of passenger mobility, uh, and thanks to ICT. And then from car sharing, it took us 10 years or less to move to the completely new services uh, in relation to this idea of shared and new reutilized. And then in less than five years with the sensor technology, we have seen a, an emergence of tremendous uh, new service models. Of course, a huge failure rate, but I really believe that this is a learning curve. Uh, we are in the experimental phase of solutions and uh, we, we must support them somehow. Uh, and then in less than two years, we have seen a huge growth of micro modal mobility. And I think that the, the, the transition is clear that with more uh, improvements in information technology, we will have even more better uh, resource effectivization, meaning that it's not anymore just designing the services, but we are, what we are seeing is how the organizations are going to improve the usage rate, meaning that increase accessibility, increase utility, utility rates so that we minimize then the environmental impact. Now, my main takeaway is that um, there are systemic barriers imposed both by physical and regulatory uh, more than human resistance that we have tended to believe in research but also in practice uh, there's a lot of focus and say oh humans are resisting these services but i think it's primarily because there's no no good infrastructure to support them and not just because people don't want to change it's usually the envir environmental design that creates the challenges for people to use different products and services and that we know from a lot of technological studies uh, i think there's more and more need for context awareness in design and not just user awareness so focusing only on what users like will not solve these problems we need to really start thinking about where they are being located how strategically they are being deployed in what locations what performance do we have there and what are the regulations more specifically and also, I think that um, inclusion needs to be reconsidered tremendously because um, I've seen from my research that there is a tendency of huge exclusion of different user communities and the tendency to oversupply early adopters, which are predominantly white people, highly educated with higher income. We need to change that, I think. Uh, design of urban mobility is definitely intertwined with, as I mentioned, the regimen of outdated rules which are definitely supporting one type of species in this ecosystem, which is the car. And I think we need to possibly move from that. The other one is that I would encourage more multi-stakeholder partnerships, especially in the design stages. But we have seen also from one of my studies that also just collaborating does, does not lead to successful implementation because someone has to take responsibility for these services and private operators usually are more efficient in doing their own job than when you have stakeholders in, involved in it uh, the last one that is that i believe that urban space is not ready for diverse mo mo modalities and that's i think where we need to start thinking about the design of these services in relation to the space that they take in cities 
So I think I'll end with this, not to take more time. Uh, I was going to plan that most of these things I found, we have also proved in another large study that we did, where we have looked at not only mobility sector, but we have looked at access-based solutions in all industrial sectors. And we have reviewed around 527 publications in research in different concepts, different business models, and looking at the systemic barriers. And we have found almost uh, similar barriers coming to, um, to what I mentioned in those case studies. Uh, and this leaves uh, some interesting space to think that sometimes it's not the fault of the developers, it's not the fault of the city stakeholders, but it's simply the systemic entanglement that we are found in today, which will take time to change. And sometimes we need to slow down the pace of technological development so that we can think about the social side of services uh, in order to not create complete disparity between these two uh, paradigms. So thanks. Uh, I hope uh, it made sense. I'm looking forward to questions or ideas, comments. Uh, so yeah. Great. So we have uh, one question at the moment. Um, so given given that space is crucial to any types, uh, sorry, given that space is crucial to any modes of mobility, including for e-scooters, do you think these dockless e-scooters and dockless bike shares to some extent will, will work because of the missing aspect of dedicated space to store them in public space? Is the dock or station based micro mobility more realistic and beneficial for these modes in the future? I hope that was clear. Uh, by research, the tendency is to show, yes, they are possibly going to be like this, uh, even if they regulate it, because, as I mentioned, the primary idea why these scooters succeeded in the first place was this huge flexibility to the user. I mean, it cannot be more flexible, drop anywhere, park anywhere. The same narrative created all the conflicts in the back. Now, it feels like that if you provide high user flexibility, you increase the operational challenges of the business. So there, we must find, I think, a middle ground. Uh, and the middle ground is something that we are currently working on a new research project where we are looking at these mobility services as part of residential housing. And I believe that could have a, a huge impact, especially with Corona times. We are seeing a tendency of people to no longer commute for work so that this reduction in commuting time and is, would shrink the vicinity by how much people commute. And if they shrink the vicinity or the parameter of how far people go to commute, uh, then the need for smaller devices will become much more higher. And I believe if they become part of the housing model where you basically can access them through your own residential uh, neighborhood, there is quite promising uh, results. So we, we are, just currently testing at least uh, six mobility pilots in six regions in Sweden, where we are trying to try to integrate this as part of the housing, including um, electric scooters, bicycles, and, and electric uh, vehicles, and see if this would be better than having these services. Or I do not think I do not think that the public stakeholders should be responsible all the time, unless we really radically decide to shrink roads and not otherwise, because the public regulations today have been primarily like designating sidewalk space for the services. But this is not the solution because more services are gonna come, meaning that more devices, because services without devices will not be able to operate. But if more come, you cannot just keep shrinking a public space, which is already, when you look at the research on urban planning and architecture, it's incredible the amount of conflict over history that the public space entails. And we cannot keep shrinking public space to make space for private operators. I think we should shrink the car space. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I hope that that answers. Great, thank you. So uh, are there any more questions? Uh, remember, if you um, raise your hand, uh, you can also ask a question live. I wish I could see everyone though. <laughs> <laughs> um, if yeah, uh, so we have uh, another question on the Q and A at the moment. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what are some of the proactive steps that local governments could take to avoid uh, the mentioned issues and be receptive of these technological advancements in multimodal mobility for a lo uh, localized uh, adaptation? 
Ado maybe adoption. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, during the study, I didn't have time to go through deeply what I've done, but I've looked at all the actions undertaken by local governments, at least in the Los Angeles city and also by the operators. And I've identified around 36 actions that were done. Primarily, they have been uh, capping the fleet size, uh, controlling the operational space, meaning that where they can park and not, and creating a lot of restrictions and also uh, controlling the speed. Now, this has had negative effects on usage rate. Uh, it has improved considerably the damage, but it has also damaged the usage rate because people apparently, when I interviewed the user groups, I could see that they have extreme high expectations on the performance of these technologies and they are not willing to give like when you introduce a service, hey, already is very flexible and suddenly you make it less flexible. That's a bad, I think, marketing strategy, but that has been happening because of the of the regulatory. I think that in my in my opinion is that the way we could go about this is more um, based on all these insights and seeing what has happened in LA and also in Sweden. Um, we need to plan strategically their deployment. We cannot have one operator having this gigantic global market. I believe we can create more local services that are shared by a number of operators that are collaboratively managed instead of competitively managed. And if businesses are competing on over the same model, it means that we might just have similar to what we have with public transport, a number of buses, but they are all maybe individual like what we have with the public transportation in London, where you have around 30 agencies that manage the overall public transport, but they are under one common brand. And I believe this could could lead one way that stakeholders start to like private operators get together, create a one shared fleet, and then they strategically position and then share the the, the, the profits and, and, and the costs instead of trying to just compete over the same locations, the same spaces and uh, have the same uh, collaboration with a, with a public stakeholder, because definitely regulations either will need to be super dynamically uh, created, which is impossible because of bureaucracies and so on, or they would have to be uh, more strategically thought in terms of how private operators can collaborate between each other. And then the cities can be the overarching stakeholder, I believe. Great, thank you. Uh, so, uh, are there any more questions at the moment? <laughs> no, it doesn't seem like it. Um, okay, um, so we've uh, run run over our time by by quite quite a bit. So, if you've got any more questions for Little Donna, you can see uh, her email address there at the moment. Uh, I'd encourage you to uh, email her directly. Um, and um, otherwise, this the last uh, breakfast seminar for uh, the semester. Uh, so check on the ITRL webpage, um, itrl.kph.se uh, under events, and you will see our new seminars coming up next semester. Thank you, little Donna, for today. Thanks everyone for listening and uh, I'm sorry for the overtime. Uh, I hope it was some useful information shared. Thank you. All right. Okay.